Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the American Indian and Alaska Native Tourism Association's Lewis and Clark webinar series. Today's educational webinar focuses on the Columbia River Salmon Historic and Culinary Trails. I'm Bruce Reddick, and I serve as a ANTA's Tribal Content Developer. I'll be your moderator today and will manage the question and answers at the end of the presentation. Please place your questions or comments in the question and answer box. For those of you who are not familiar with AANTA, for nearly two decades, AANTA has served as a national voice for American Indian nations engaged in cultural tourism, providing technical assistance and training to tribes and native businesses engaged in tourism, hospitality, and recreation. We're excited that this year's annual American Indian Tourism Conference, the AITC, uh, and the, the theme, Reimagine, Reemerge, Reunite, Stronger Together in Indian Country, will take place in person at the Wikopa Casino Resort on the Fort McDowell Yavapai Nation in Arizona from October 25th through the 28th. During the conference, the winners of AANTA's Excellent in Tourism Industry Awards will be announced, recognizing native tourism that promotes tribal culture, history, heritage, and arts through tourism. You can find links to AITC registration and other AANTA resources in the chat box. Now, before we begin, we have a few poll questions and we're gonna do the first one right now. So if you take a, a, a couple minutes just to answer this poll question, that'll be great. And uh, we'll share the results with you. Poll question number one, have you ever visited the Columbia River region? And the poll question's up. All right, quite a few people over uh, almost 60% have visited the region. So thank you for uh, providing your feedback. And again, thank you for joining us for this morning uh, for today's webinar, Columbia River uh, Salmon History and Culture Culinary uh, Trails. In our work identifying travel attractions along the Lewis and Clark Trail, uh, we took a tour up there a couple months ago. We were impressed about how salmon has shaped the lives of the people who have lived here since time immemorial. Uh, this, these include the Nez Perce tribe, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs Reservation of Oregon, and the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakima Nation. Today's industry, industry is a vibrant ec economic and culinary resource for the Columbia River tribes attracting attention from various publications, such as Travel Magazine, Food and Wine, and the New York Times, as well as being featured on television shows such as the Food Network, the Travel Channel, and the Cooking Channel. I'm so pleased and uh, excited uh, for to uh, present today's speakers. And our first speaker is Buck Jones. Uh, he's a salmon marketing specialist for Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. Buck is Cayuse, one of the bands of Confederate tribes of the Umatilla uh, Indian Reservation. He's a multi-decade treaty fisherman. Buck, who has been employed since uh, 2004 for the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, or CRITFC, started as a fisheries technician, but uh, he now serves as salmon marketing specialist. He works on product development, developing classes on cold water and boat safety, and provides quality handling classes for approximately 700 tribal fishers. Buck is co-chair of the Food Sovereignty Subcommittee of the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians and a board member of Gorge Grown Food Network, Mid-Columbia Economic Development District, and Columbia Gorge Tourism Alliance. Buck, thank you for presenting today, and I'll turn it over to Buck now. Uh, thank you, Bruce, for that uh, warm uh, welcome. Yeah, as Bruce mentioned, my name is Buck Jones. I'm a, a member of the Cayuse, Cayuse Indian, and a member of the, which is one of the bands of Confederated Tribes in the Umatil Indian Reservation. So um, our people have been, uh, you know, in the basin, the Columbia River Basin, since time immemorial. You know, when Lewis and Clark came, um, we already had a, significant uh, presence here along the river. Um, and this is probably what they seen back in the day. This picture of Little Falls. 
and you can advance it. Um, yeah, so our people, um, um, you know, salmon, salmon is a cultural relevant for, for our people. It is, uh, um, the next slide, please. Yeah, and so we've always been here uh, for uh, uh, harvesting the salmon, but uh, not just harvesting the salmon. It's a uh, uh, culture relevant to our people. Um, you know, it's uh, we have ceremonies for uh, for the salmon as they return. Um, yeah, next slide. Uh, you know, our, uh, our, our culture is based on the, the abundance of salmon. Um, we have, a, 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 they're considered one of our first foods, and, uh, and we recognize that with, uh, by having first food ceremonies. This is a, a picture of, a, of the Longhouse, uh, 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 probably a, a salmon feast that they're having on the left, and then uh, and actually the salmon that is getting prepared um, for one of our first, uh, for our salmon, salmon, uh, first food, first salmon returns. Uh, the picture there is that long uh, longhouse at Salilo, um, where the dams was uh, flooded in that first picture. They're they're still there, but they're underwater now. And uh, but we still uh, carry these traditions on uh, with with these songs that we're taught. Uh, next slide. As I mentioned, it is a, uh, a first foods, and this is, uh, um, this is some of the the foods that we have for our feasts that we have for the returning of the of the of the first foods. You know, we uh, we have to be stewards of the of the land and the water um, for for these foods to return. So it's important that we uh, you know identify that and and keep practicing the songs and the and the teachings that our ancestors taught for, for not only us, but for, you know, our future generations. Um, it is uh, still, still today, we're, we're doing these um, things. And you can have a, one more slide, next slide, and, and see another picture of the, of the ceremonies that we have for our, uh, for a returning of our salmon. Um, so the, on the next slide, you can see that we've already we've had uh, we've had trade and we've had commerce, you know, between our tribes and and, and these trails have have, all, have always been there. You, you can see the region I'm talking about. There is the Salilo Falls. It, it was a a actually you know tribes that came and traded for salmon uh, from all across Indian country. You know, uh, this this is. Uh, you know, trade routes that have been established throughout, you know, throughout time or whatever, that people would come and gather at Salilo Falls and, you know, bring, bring what they have, uh, like from the, 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 wet, the Midwest, you know, buffalo and, and game from, from the mountain regions and, you know, shellfish and, and uh, the, uh, from the coast. And so these, these trade routes are something that, you know that our our people have had for you know for centuries and and it's really kind of something that you know something in the, in the work that I do I'd like to see these trade routes reestablished you know with with other with other tribes throughout the country you know um, that are and it could be just for economic and but uh, also you know just cultural things that you know if we could get a a trade route from you know wild rice in the Midwest or orange juice or oranges from Florida, you know, um, bison that is, you know, uh, other tribes have got. So it, I think it's really important, you know, to show that this, this, this photo or this map here of, of the, of the established uh, trade routes, and we're talking about culinary trails, you know, uh, this just goes to show that you know we've always had trade, and it's not uh, it's not something new that we've had. And uh, I think it was really important to sh to kind of show that in context of this presentation today. Um, yeah, you can you can advance it, please. So 
you know, all the tribes in the uh, in the region and around the 1850s, you know, ceded ceded land uh, to uh, the to the government or whatever. When we ceded all these uh, ceded all this land, we didn't um, we didn't give up our right, you know, to uh, go gather and hunt and fish at, at our, sp our usual custom spots, and that's really something that's really important to uh, I think that our ancestors really did because um, we we you know we would have never given up and I really just thank uh, our ancestors for putting that in there that why would they sign something if we couldn't gather and go hunt in our traditional spots and I think that you know all tribes uh, of the four tribes and I'll show that next that in the basin signed something similar to this this is a, a Yakima nation uh, well, how it was put in their in their treaties, you know that um, for the for the land that we uh, we had given up, you know um, we didn't give up our our gathering spots and our, our fishing spots uh, 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 to go on a reservation to become reservations. And, and that being said, people along the Columbia River, um, they still are on the Columbia River. They didn't want to, uh, you know, they they did have a reservations that they um, was established, but our people that wanted to fish, they're still on the Columbia River. They don't, they didn't want to, um, you know, leave, leave their region there. So we're still there. And this is just a, a member of a, a map of, of the, of the tribes that are uh, the treaty tribes along the river. And if you see the uh, the 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 outline of the the darker kind of orange there, that was all the ceded lands that they gave up that the tribes had uh, had given up in the region or whatever. And then the outside of the of the reservations, the little bit lighter color, that was actually original lands of their uh, other reservations. And and the and now the current reservations is a little bit darker colors in that. And as Bruce mentioned, these are these are the four four treaty tribes that uh, have treaty fishing rights along the Columbia River: the Yakima Nation, uh, Nez Perce Nation, Umatilla, and Warm Springs. So th those are the tribes that currently have a. Uh, uh, treaty fishing rights that you know our, our treaties established um for that so we're we're a current uh fishing uh a community and uh we've a, my work in uh, cryptic you know has has followed up from a person that really uh set up some quality control uh you can uh, advance it quality control or quality fishing uh um uh standards for our tribal fishers and that's called uh um, next slide, please. Yeah, we've we've uh, we've set up uh, quality control uh, classes called HACCP classes. HACCP, HACCP is a hazard analysis critical control point. Um, it it tells us how we handle our fish. You know, from the time we catch it, uh, making sure that it's put in ice and, and bled and 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 as it goes through the food chain, because our our, our fish is a you know, even though we do subsistence fish and uh, have a, have our own gatherings and stuff, it does go through the food chain. So we want to make sure that the fish that we uh, that we get out in the food chain is actually, you know, a, a quality product and that it's not going to get nobody sick. So we've had these classes for numerous years and we um, have probably um, put out 600 certificates of that of that class and that's one of the largest uh fishing uh uh you know groups that have taken that class we don't charge our fishers for that we um we do it our uh we just get food experts and do uh and provide those classes and you can advance the next slide and so this is just a uh, part of what we do for our fish you know keep make sure that they're they're iced and they're uh and they're well done. Um, we developed a fisher's handbook, which is on our next slide, please. Um, this is about our tenth edition of this of this handbook that we we provide for our uh, for our fishers. You know, it uh, it's uh, got a bunch of safety stuff, some marketing or like a um, sanitation plans and and things where we can check check a list off of it. Um, it's been really popular uh, to have. It's something that we. Uh, 
we develop and give to our fishers and they got this in their pocketbook on a, in their pocket that they can use and, and use it for guidance um a couple of years ago when uh, when president obama was in uh in office, they came up with a, a food uh, safety modernization act. So we developed a uh, a uh, a food safety team to develop our own uh, tribal fishing uh, processing codes. Next slide, please. Um, that we thought would uh, that we thought we would uh, you know because we was kind of worried about the uh, the food safety uh, modernization act and how it's going to get, impact our fishers and our sovereignty. So we developed our own uh, tribal processing codes um, that we uh, were recommendations that we uh, presented to to our tribes. You know, this uh, promotes our own sovereignty, uh, reduces the enforcement against states and counties and cities against our uh, against our uh, fishers. And it sure's uh, again, as I mentioned, you know the the, the fish that they're getting is uh, is quality, uh, and uh, and and actually a real good thing out of that on the next slide is that we was able to uh, the work that we had done was done by the University of uh, Arkansas Indigenous Food and Agricultural Initiative. They developed a model tri um, model tribal food and agricultural code. Uh, that was a resource for tribes to to put up food code food codes and model laws for uh, for the individual tribes, and we was uh, we was lucky. I mean, we was really fortunate that they used our work in this national rollout for the tribe uh, for the fishing. And these are just recommendations, like I thought, but we thought that was, you know, pretty good work from our, our food safety team and our legal counsel that developed these, that this was used in a national, a national uh, uh, rollout national food code model. So, you know, it just helps us, um, uh, like I said, to uh, keep the, keep it, so we're not getting impacted with our sovereignty by the other entities. And then we develop our own food codes and we have our own laws then uh you know then we have those on paper it's it, it's really kind of an outstanding uh job and i really appreciate the work that my team did so this is uh forward please so this is kind of how we do our um some of our direct to the public sales that you know some of these uh these uh, where these people are uh, selling are not on reservations or uh, along the river at a treaty fishing access site. So they have to abide by the local uh, local and uh, city laws or county laws if they're in a farmer's market. And we've also um, with with this, we've also had, a, you know, improvement of, of more like brick and mortars, like a, our next person that's coming on, Bridget. You know, we got uh, people that are selling directly to the public. You know, throughout, throughout, and it's going all across the country and, and even into different parts of the world. But uh, um, yeah, next slide. And this is just uh, how we call it direct to the public or over the bank sales that we sell um, to people that come out to the gorge. So if you come out to the gorge, this is in Cascade Locks, and they'll um, they have fishers that sell directly to the public. Um, so yeah, you can advance it, please. So this is, uh, you know, um, how current day fishing came, you know, when Lewis and Clark did come, they did see us ca uh, fishing on scaffolds like that. And to this present day, you know, we still do scaffold fishing or platform fishing. Uh, this is uh, an another fisher here on the bottom left that's fishing in a, uh, on a platform, a scaffold. You can see it on the back, uh, on, on the back of his photo and, uh, you know, promoting their fish and uh, 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 one of our elders, I believe from Warm Springs that is fishing, uh, uh, cooking the fish on a fan style there. So it is, uh, it's still, we're still out there. We're still present in the, in the region and uh, you can advance it. Um, you know, it's probably never gonna be like this again. This, the falls are, you know, inundated and stuff like that. But I think it's important to see that if you go to the next slide that we still do, we still do platform fishing like that. Uh, that's a fisher on a, one of the tributaries of the Klickitat, uh, you know, pulling in a fish, probably like a, 
like Lewis and Clark and Sin, and then uh, the bottom right is a, a platform fissure on the main stem of the river of the Columbia River, and uh, and a lot of boats now we do gill net fishing up on the top right, and there's one more picture on the next slide that shows a fisher uh, checking nets in, in a gill net. You know, as you can see, it looks like a big lake or whatever. It kind of is what they are, but they are. But they, it, it is a river and there is flow um, through that. And I think I'm getting to the end of it. I don't know where I'm at for time. I just wanted to end with this uh, picture here of, of, a, of a current fisherman that has, a, you know, the, this is a species that we're targeting and we're, we're fishing to the, uh, you know, this week, actually, right now, this current day, you know, uh, still promoting our sovereignty and, uh, you know, uh, of getting this beautiful salmon and i i think that's it bruce yeah that was great buck thanks so much uh great presentation um i, I had visited the columbia river with uh, sherry rupert our executive director uh several months ago we went to cascade locks and ate lunch at brigham fish market and and buck showed us around and everything the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission does, they're into so many different aspects of fish, fishing along, along the Columbia. It was, it was very, very impressive. So thank you so much, Buck. Um, we had several questions come in that are in the chat and, and we'll address those at the end of the presentations. Uh, so I, I will go back to those a little bit later. Uh, but right now we're gonna do another poll question. And so we have poll question number two. And poll question number two is, have you ever visited any of the tribes along the Columbia River? And those are the tribes that Buck had, had talked about, Warm Springs, uh, Umatilla, the Yakima, or the Nez Perce. And we'll give just a, a minute or so to go through that poll. All right. Well, it looks like a pretty good uh, high percentage, 61%. That's great. A lot of people are familiar with all the tribes up along, along the Columbia River there. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for uh, providing that feedback and answering the poll question. Uh, we'll go on to our next presenter, who is uh, Bridget McConville. Uh, she's the owner of Salmon King Fisheries. Uh, Bridget is an enrolled member of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, Wasco, and Paiute and first started preparing fish when she was eight years old. She got her start cleaning fish before uh, handing them off to her grandmother and mother and aunts to fillet, but by age 10, she was cutting fish on her own. She has now been working with fish for more than 40 years, selling, sharing, and trading with those not so fortunate. In 2011, she opened a retail store, Salmon King Fisheries, where she shared her traditional way of life and enjoys fishing with her husband. Bridget, thanks for presenting today, and I'll let you take over. Oh, make sure to unmute. <laughs> um, thank you. In Nich Maitsky, in Minaimu Ma Chatmai Ma Wanishaj, Bridget McConville. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome. And uh, like Bruce said, my name is Bridget McConville, and I'm from Warm Springs. I'm all three tribes. And a little bit about myself, um, prior to doing my fish marketing, um, I served as our tribal anthropologist for my tribe for 20 years, um, a platypus. I went to Uni Oregon State University for my undergrad and did my graduate work at University of Oregon. So I always call myself a platypus. I'm not a beaver or a duck. <laughs> anyway, so um, from then on, uh, I worked for my tribe and did a lot of documentation with my work and as well as my family. And I'll get a little bit more into it, but through my lifetime, my grandma and I had documented 186 uh, native species to the plateau region. Everything from edibles to medicinals to things that you can dye um fabrics with and um so that's kind of a, a real close to my heart is um continuing on with our traditional uh native species within our region and 
Um, so I worked for my tribe and did a lot of documentation in our reservation lands, which is 642,000 acres. In our ceded lands, which is 10 million acres, our usual and accustomed lands, as well as our Aboriginal territories for land designations for my tribe. Um, so back in, um, when was it? Jeez, 2008, I think it was, I told my tribe, you know, I feel like I paid my dues and I'm going to leave. I'm going to quit. And so I left my job and started doing more fishing, doing more crafting and art and uh, cultural education to the public and schools. And, and I love that. And so I started fishing more and we were talking about uh, how I like to trade with people or sometimes I sell, but a lot of it was trading. And my grandma was like, well, why don't you start your store, you know, start selling your fish. And so we started, uh, opened the store in February 6, 2011. And we had one product. We had smoked salmon. And when you do one thing right, you're going to do it well. And so we started with that. And now we have 23 different fish items. And we sell fish and um, beads and beaded items because when Lewis and Clark came, they brought things to trade. And in nature, our tribes, our plateau people can create every color, primary color in nature except blue. And when the traders brought the blue beads, it just exploded. You know, everything became blue. You know, we before we saw it in nature, we saw it in the water, we saw it in the sky. But when they brought the blue beads, it was something that we had, you know, it was new to us. And so we started creating things. And, you know, when Lewis and Clark came, they saw things that they never saw before, you know, um, all of the regions that they visited, they had some focus of remembrance from that area. And when they came to the Columbia River, it was salmon, you know, and by the time they got to us, they were starving, they were half dead, you know, and they even went as far as eating their dogs and horses. And they didn't even want to eat the salmon that was offered to them and the roots and the berries that were preserved for the winter. But eventually, you know, they figured it out that it was a good nutrition and it was um, kept them full and gave them a lot of energy. So when Lewis and Clark passed through, you know, the, I was reading the journal entries of their, their, their travels and it's kind of comical the way that they didn't like it you know, the processed fish, the chilai, they call it. It's a pulverized salmon with steelhead grease. And the further down river you went, the more steelhead grease was added to the fish. And so it was, you know, kind of interesting just to, to read those things. But, you know, after they came, the government started to... Um, enact the treaties with the tribes all over the country. And we had the month of June in 1855, they negotiated treaties with all four treaty tribes. And that was General Joel Palmer, who was head of the army negotiation for the treaties. And when he got to the people that eventually came Warm Springs, uh, they wanted, um, they were very specific and they were very smart. You know, I always think that our, our leaders back in the 1800s weren't thinking of themselves. They were thinking of us today and how history in time would affect everything that, that we've done. And so they negotiated it and we came to Warm Springs. Some stayed on the river to continue the trade and fish and do their lifestyle there. But a lot of them came to Warm Springs. And, but the first thing we did was in June, that was a huge fishing time for the summer salmon and the sockeye. They came to Warm Springs and then they turned around and went right back because it was fishing season. So there's a continuation of travel back and forth for a lot of our people. And 
and I do that. You know, I live in Warm Springs. Um, we we live in in the Dalles, Oregon, when we're fishing, but and we have a home there. But we also have a home here in Warm Springs, and we go back and forth. And so our fishing begins in um, February or March with our sturgeon. Uh, we and all of these fish I'm going to talk about are fish that we retail in our stores. So we start with the sturgeon and the spring salmon, the summer salmon, the sockeye, the fall salmon, the steelhead, and the coho salmon. Those are all of the fish that we process in various ways and retail at our store. And um, it, we've been doing it for generations and generations, but being in the retail business with a storefront has only been since 2011. So we're 10 years old this past February. And we, I am, I can proudly say that I am the only woman owned minority. Uh, I had to write it down. Where is it? Minority woman owned on reservation sole proprietorship anywhere. You know, and I'm really proud of that because I do have a lot of help, but legally on paper, I'm like the sole owner, but it's a um, family run business. You know, my husband and the family catch the fish more, the majority of the time. And I, once they catch it and clean it, and then I take it from there. Uh, I am HACCP certified, uh, food handler certified and we have a HACCP plan that it's reviewed every year and redone just to be safe and so they catch the fish and then from there I take it I only take the they grade them so like when you commercially sell they grade the fish uh one two three and four so one being unblemished unbruised those are the only ones that I keep to retail and so I bring them home the day that they're caught and I either go to the cannery with them to have them commercially canned uh, or I bring them home and fillet them and do something with them that day. You know, they're never out of the water more than 24 hours and it's the best quality. We have a really good flash freezer and it just it puts it away really well. And so... Our business, we wholesale. Um, right now, we're taking orders for next year. We're we'll fill the orders. I, I think we're filled. Have filled the orders right now, so it's just catching fish for the store. And then we have the retail. We um, we we sell the can, the smoke, the frozen fillets. Sometimes we'll do the fresh fillets. Uh, the wind dried, um, I don't know if there's a picture of the wind dried on there. We have, um, that is one of our best sellers. Um, it's the oldest processed form of fish that we, we retail. Uh, it hasn't changed in forever. You know, it's been the same process. You know, we talk about a little of the trade network. Well, the tribes have documented evidence of trading with tribes at the mouth of the Columbia uh, for salt, you know, or they'd bring up salt. And, you know, if you think about the whole Columbia River with Celilo being kind of the base, that was the trade network center or the first mall, you know, or native Wall Street, you know, something like that you could call it. And if you wanted it, you can get it, you know, whatever you needed there and you brought and worked on your best and brought it to the river to trade what you needed for. That's the way that I had thought about it. And, um, but the, the wind dried salmon is, is right now one of our most popular items that's being shipped out worldwide. You know, we are shipping worldwide now and it's amazing, you know, what, can happen with um, social media. It's a free platform for marketing, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you know, all of those, it's free to put your services out there. And so those are the, the products that we have. The picture on the left is our Christmas box. And that is 
offer it every year. We're going to be marketing it in about a week. It's a limited product, but it has the smoked canned and fresh canned salmon, huckleberry jam, those trade crackers called hardtacks, uh, Oregon walnuts and hazelnuts, and a smoked elk and a piece of wind dried salmon. And those are marketed each year. Uh, last year we did 50 boxes. This year we're doing 75. And but last year they sold out in three days. You know, so it's a really hot topic that people look for every year. And I've been doing it for about six years now. And uh, I think there'll be a huckleberry sauce or a choke cherry sauce that I did this year if I have have enough. And so it, it's it's a great item. Um, Next slide. You know, that's a picture of some of the wind dried I just pulled off of the racks. It's a great one. Next slide. Okay, so this is one of the faces of our marketing. Um, I have two daughters and I use their picture on the cans. One of them loves smoked canned salmon. The other one loves fresh cans. So I said, oh, you know what? Do you care if I put you on the label? And they're like, yeah, go ahead. And so it's it's fun. People have asked for posters of these. Um, if you want to do the next slide, you'll see the other daughter. So this is my youngest. And people want their photo, you know. So we've done a few photos, um, small poster size of them. And they're they're nice to photograph. <laughs> but it's good marketing in a, a young Indian lady on a can of salmon. That's kind of neat. Next one. There's me. Um, I'm, I have never put myself on any marketing. This was a picture that my husband took of me and did some editing on it. And we ended up putting it on the smoke can sturgeon. He was like, you have to be on something, you know, cause he's on every can of picture of him fishing. And then it's either one of the daughters and, and I, I was on nothing, you know, they, I put them on everything. And so I thought, well, I don't know how it'll sell. We'll put it on a bottom shelf and <laughs> it'll be on the picture somewhere. You know, so next slide. Yeah, so um, part of our services, um, like I said before, <clears throat> excuse me, we wholesale, uh, we retail in the store. We also do, <clears throat> excuse me, we also do these community sales. So if people come in the store and they want they want to fish, say they want to fish and it's a frozen fish, and then they ask me, well, do you ever do fresh sales? And, I'm, and I tell them, well, do you have neighbors that might want to sell? So they get a hold of their neighbors, and then I pull in with a, a quarter toad or a full toad of fish and they can pick their own fish out. We weigh it right there. We'll fillet it for them and we'll just be in one community and create this, this sale. You know, they get their fresh product and we get a sale and it, it works really great. Um, we are the only <clears throat> um, frozen and fresh fish store east of the Cascades. So there's no place anywhere in Bend, Redmond, Madras, Prineville, anywhere east of the Cascades that's doing this. So we have a huge market. We're always busy. And um, we do have, uh, we were invited by the Bend Chamber uh, to look for a spot in Bend, you know, to expand our business. But a lot of it has to do with, you know, manpower, you know, people that are willing to work and people that want to be in Bend and it's just grown so much. It's the highest market that our, our best customer or highest volume um, of customers come from Bend. And, you know, Bend has the Olympic ski team that lives there during the winter season to train. And we have um, several NFL players and movie stars and music famous musicians. I think Eminem, has a home in Bend. 
Um, so we have all of these these great opportunities to to um, market there, and I, I'm I'm really happy with how much we're doing um, right now. But in the future, you know, as long as there's fish running, <clears throat> we're going to be able to we're going to be catching it, and we're going to be um, be able to market it. And um, a little bit all else about what we do is. Um, we have a cultural education uh, series that I do, and I go into classrooms and teach about um, the fish history. And I like to do a video and do a show and tell with um, items that were trade values, like pelts and um, beads, and just things that that can um, educate them. Because if you hear it, read it touch it, feel it, and even taste it, you're going to remember it, you know, so I've gone into many schools and have done that, and so we do a project, also an art project of some kind, and then I feed them fish, you know, so they get the whole gamut of what entails the fish, and then we also do a catering, we have a catering service that uh, we offer the um the salmon cooked over the fire with a stick and we've done then a um like my husband will shoot an animal and then we'll smoke cut it up and smoke it and serve it and then have all the side options that the any catering business has we've done small groups like 10 people and our largest group was almost 900 and we had a treaty celebration on our reservation and the museum catered us um, to to do the cooking for that and we did the whole meal and it was great it was so much fun um, we got to dress up in our traditional outfits and cook the salmon and everything and it was really great the faces of our cans and their friends dressed up too I made them matching dresses and they served people and um I know how to do um, some of the specialty items like the smoked eels and the caviar and, you know, all of those really fun things. So we had these hors d'oeuvres on these big plates and platters and it was served to all the people as well. And uh, we did a, a wedding, a traditional wedding and a trade for a family from Yakima and we provided the fish and the meat and then the family <clears throat> the young lady's family gathered for the whole year. We planted a whole year and they provided all of the traditional foods um, from their tribe. And, and then we prepared it for them. And it, that was a great event because it was like 600 people at the wedding. And then it was just great. Okay. And then uh, let's see. One of the new things we're doing is we're... Um, going to be doing a um, fish guide service with our our business and we're going to be providing meals so that look out for that in the near future but I'd like to thank you for listening to me and um, hope you visit our website and social media pages and order some great food because we love it and take a lot of pride in what we do and thank you Bridget thank you so much uh Thank you so much for uh, for presenting today. Uh, just uh, we, uh, on our outreach trip, we went to Warm Springs and Bridget was very accommodating and showed us around and we visited Salmon King store and saw all our products and she does have a wide array of pro products. And when I see the photos of her food, it always makes me hungry. So if you, if you, have, if you are on uh, Facebook or Instagram, uh, take a look at all of the different things that, that she offers, that her company offers. Um, Salmon King just has such great products and it's just, it's a great story and, and family run and, and just it, very, very neat story. So thanks again, Bridget, really appreciate it. Um, poll question number three, this is our last poll question. All right, uh, here it is. Uh, do you consider yourself a culinary tourist or a foodie? I know the foodie is a big buzzword right now.
All right. Well, it looks like there's a lot of foodies here and a lot of culinary people. <laughs> so that's great. That's very, that's very cool. Again, visiting Columbia River, we're thinking of the fall too and about the next couple of months is, is a great time to visit along there, but they just do such a great job, all the fishers and, and seeing the platform fishers. We saw a couple of those out there as well, but yeah, it's just really gaining a lot of attention um, from a lot of culinary magazines again and, and shows, uh, a lot of different uh, special uh, shows are being done about that area. So thank you for uh, answering that poll question as well. And uh, next up, we have two speakers from Travel Oregon and we appreciate them being there uh, here. They're now ANTA members and we, we're really happy about that. Uh, we have Michelle Liberty, is the tribal tourism li liaison for Travel Oregon. And she's a member of Cayuse, uh, Umatilla and Walla Walla tribes. Michelle Liberty grew up in Northeastern uh, Oregon. After a stint working in marketing and advertising for domestic and international agencies, Michelle returned to her Eastern Oregon roots, taking the position of marketing director for Wild Horse Resort and Casino. During her tenure at uh, Wild Horse, Michelle accompanied the Travel Oregon team to such international trade shows as ITV Berlin and IPW, where she promoted the tribe's Temiskulet Cultural Institute, their casino, and other tribal tourism throughout the state. Twelve years later, Michelle opened Attitude Inc., a marketing consulting firm. She now serves as Travel Oregon's tribal tourism liaison. Um, also with, uh, from Travel Oregon, we have Lisa Itell. Lisa serves as a uh, Director of Global Strategic Partnerships for Travel Oregon, and she leads Travel Oregon's grant programs and team and oversees the execution of partnerships and sponsorships and collaborates with Oregon's economic development infrastructure. Previously, Lisa worked as Global Sales Manager, Americas and Oceana for Travel Oregon. Lisa's uh, favorite Oregon activity is spending time with her family at a cabin in Joseph, Oregon. Welcome, Michelle and Lisa, and thank you for presenting today. I'll let you take over. That's great. Thank you so much, Bruce. And good morning, everyone. Um, like Bruce just mentioned, my name is Lisa Edel, and I'm the Director of Global Strategic Partnerships at Travel Oregon. We are the State Tourism Office, um, and our job is to inspire travel that drives community enhancement and economic development around our state. I wanted to thank the IANTA staff for inviting us to be part of this panel today, just to have a few minutes to share with you about what we are doing to celebrate Oregon's indigenous cultures. As mentioned previously, indigenous people have lived in Oregon since time immemorial. And as part of sharing stories of Oregon's people and places, Tribal Oregon has helped convene the Oregon Tribal Tourism Working Group, which consists of representatives from all of Oregon's nine confederated tribes. This group is working in partnership with Travel Oregon to ensure visitors can experience Oregon indig indigenous cultures, especially indigenous foods, like the experiences you heard about today from Buck and Bridget. To assist with this collaboration, Travel Oregon contracted with Michelle Liberty from Attitude Marketing. And I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle for a few minutes to share about our current outreach and our plans moving forward. Michelle? Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, some of you, I don't know who's participating in the um, in this webinar, but some of you may remember that we had a tribal tourism working committee 10 to 12 years ago. And at that time, all the tribes, except for one, had a casino, and that was it. There were two tribal museums, and our tourism product was pretty limited. But um, we did produce a travel guide to Indian country at that time, and it was very well received by the public and the tribes were very happy with it, played a big role in developing that piece. So um, eventually that committee um, discontinued and recently Travel Oregon has wanted to reach out again to all the tribes and that's why they hired me. So I was able to go out towards the end of 2019 to all the reservations and uh, meet with the tribes and find out what's going on everywhere. And it was so exciting because there is so much happening in Indian country and we have so much more in the way of tourism product than we did that 10 or 15 years ago. So in meeting with the tribes, really I wanted to point out what the benefits were of working with Travel Oregon. Um, it's an opportunity to take advantage of a lot of educational programs, promotional opportunities, industry networking, and um, grants are available to both the tribes and individual entrepreneurs, tribal entrepreneurs. 
It's also a chance for the tribes to play a role in uh, state tourism. And right now we're inviting tribal representatives to participate in a focus group to develop Travel Oregon's strategic plan. So that'll be an important opportunity for everyone. Um, also, we want to work, like I said, with the tribal entrepreneurs, which is has been a little more challenging to um, to reach and to find everyone, but that is definitely a goal. And we want to help the tribal communities and the communities around the tribes understand the benefits of tourism. It really is a great economic tool for everybody. Travel Oregon benefits from this relationship and collaboration too, in that they get to find out more about uh, tribal tourism businesses. They have more to promote. They can um, step in and help where uh, business needs data or research or training. Um, it also helps them fulfill their promise of the unique visitor experience for people who come to Oregon. And um, it also is teaching everyone how to work with each other. Every tribe does things differently and how you proceed in, in collaborating with a state organization like this is, is done differently on each reservation. So we're learning how to work with everybody. And um, we've developed the working committee now and uh, have representatives from every tribe. And what's really fun is we have not just the marketing directors and the casino people, which is what the old group kind of was, because that's all we had, but now we have people in cultural resources and, and small business. So it gives us a, a really great um, insight into what's going on with each of the tribes. So we started that, like I said, in late 2019, then the pandemic hit, everything ground to a halt. I haven't gotten to see people for a long time or been out to visit the reservations again. And so now as things are hopefully getting better and better and safer out there, we'll be able to, to go out and, and meet with everybody again and, and get things moving forward. And we actually have one project we're preparing to launch right now and I'll let Lisa tell you about that. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Like Michelle said, um, the first initiative of the Oregon Tribal Tourism Working Group is to actually recreate Oregon's Guide to Indian Country, which Michelle previously mentioned. The group really wants to develop a tool to give visitors a new vision of Oregon's indigenous cultures and open visitors up to the rich and time-honored cultures behind the traditions and customs that have been passed down from generation to generation. Everything in nature is sacred and in Native American culture and tribal people show the utmost honor and respect for all of these living creatures. We want visitors to come see for themselves all that Oregon's Native American culture has to offer. We want people to go beyond the cinematic vision seen on television and in movies and feed their soul by experiencing the many tribal communities, diverse cultures, and the history of this vast unspoiled land that we have the privilege of calling home. I really want to thank Ayanta again for allowing Michelle and I just to be on here for a few minutes just to share kind of what we're doing with Oregon's nine confederated tribes and we just really appreciate the opportunity to connect with anyone on today's call to just collaborate on ideas that you might have and how you are sharing the stories of Indian country in your own communities. So thank you for listening and again I would be open to collaboration if anybody wanted to reach out. So thanks again and back to you Bruce. Or yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Lisa, Michelle. Thank you so much for joining in to this morning. Really appreciate it. And thanks for your support. Um, we also want to thank all of our other presenters again today and the National Park Service, Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail for their support of these webinars. Ayanta is working with the National Park Service to promote events like this and other attractions uh, along the trail on two websites, nativeamerica.travel, which is Ayanta's tourism site, website and the geotourism focused website Lewis and Clark travel website who we work with Solomar uh, also on Solomar International so we'd like to thank both of them too uh, it's a great partnership and we really enjoy working with all the entities we have about five minutes left with questions and answers and I see we've gotten quite a lot of them up in the in the uh, question and answer box um, some of them have been answered already Buck's been on it that's great uh, I'll just read off some of these so we can kind of see uh, what types of questions and the answers are, are most of the types of salmon, harvested kings, Chinook, and uh, Buck had answered mainly their Chinook, but during the different times there are sockeye, coho, and a few steelhead. There's sturgeon in the winter. 
And again, going to, to Bridget's visiting her store, she had most all of these up on, on her rack. We, of course, we walked out with some salmon. <laughs> and then we had a comment. Uh, it wasn't really a question from Ben Rupert. Uh, Buck, not a question, just thanking you for your conservation efforts. Great presentation. I'm a member of the Duck Valley Shoshone Paiute tribe. We historically had the salmon migrate up the Columbia River to the Snake River and finally to the Oahe River. We would harvest the salmon at the headwaters of the Oahe River at the Nevada-Idaho border. All the dams along the rivers have eliminated the return of the salmon. Yeah, we actually had a Nevada Tribal Tourism Conference up in Oahe uh, several years ago, and I remember the tribe talking about this. And uh, yeah, Buck had just uh, said so detrimental to your people and tribal people overall. It, it's too bad you can't get the salmon back up in those those native runs up there. Um, do the tribes have fishing programs to teach the youth how to fish the river? And uh, again, Buck uh, uh, answered pre COVID, we had salmon camps that were held at our member tribes. Uh, these would rotate between the tribes and highlight the tribe's fisheries. Our elders usually teach their family members how to fish and we have multi-generational fishers. That's just a great story. Again, going back through the, all the heritage of fishing along the Columbia River. Um, uh, there was a question at the website for Bridget's business and I believe that was put up in the chat as well. You can find that in the chat answers, but it is salmonkingfisheries.com. Again, it's salmonkingfisheries.com. And uh, just a thank you to Buck. And uh, another one for Buck, how many types of fish are found in the Columbian River? Are there other invasive species that impact the salmon? That's a good question. Um, many carp, bass, and catfish. Pike minnow is a large presence and the concern of pike that are up river. So yeah, the invasive species is a, is a big problem and, and kind of around where I'm at as well, up around uh, Nevada, Pyramid Lake and, and Lake Tahoe. Uh, I'll bounce over to the chat here and see if there's any questions that I missed. Um, I'm not seeing, oh, I see the, uh, are the waters evaluated for pollutants? And it looks like it was answered by Brittany Churchill, the waters evaluated from the input of the dam, the Dolls Dam and the Bonneville Dam. And um, a lot of the information that Buck presented, I know there was a manual and some marketing materials. Um, Critif ha has an excellent website. I'm always referring to it and, and Buck will say, oh, it's on our website. So yeah, there's a lot of brochures, a lot of information. So uh, if you go to their website, Columbia River, just uh, Google Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission and it'll pop right up. Uh, let's see, just a lot of good comments throughout. Is there a newsletter email blast to stay up to date on your offerings? I love the idea of the it box coming up. Uh, don't know, uh, Buck, would you like to answer that? Do you have a newsletter? I think that was targeted to Bridget, but uh, Cryptic does not have a newsletter right now. We do, um, we have a newsletter, but it's more for our We've, we've kind of, with COVID, kind of transitioned to uh, some COVID outreach, but not specifically. But if you go on cryptic.org, there's a lot of information that's on there. Great. Thank you. Uh, Bridget, would you like to answer that in regards to a newsletter? Yeah, we don't have a formal newsletter, but we do updates every day on our social media and try to do weekly on the website. So I had questions on here as well as questions on social media already about the Christmas boxes, the food boxes. So in a week, we're going to post the price and availability. Uh, so we'll be able to um, get that out into the market. Oh, yeah. Bridget, could you share just real quick your experience with the listing on Native Travel too? I know you had some good positive input from that as well. Yeah, it with when you guys came down, you mean? Or uh, yeah, with the listing, I think you had a couple uh, interested people, or they hit on the page. Yeah, so I had the opportunity to feed uh, two busloads of people as a catering, a box catering, and they found my information on on your website on the um, ayanta.org site, 
And so they called me or messaged me on the my email. They linked it from the website to the email and then asked for inquiries. So I gave them our catering list for, for um, food boxes. So we had options of smoked salmon wraps or smoked salmon salads with a, a fruit and a drink. And we got to feed them all. And it was 60 per bus. It was about 60 per bus. So there was two of them. And we have a couple others that have some late travel um, and they visit your website, they said all the time. So it's exciting to know that there's you're getting a lot of hits, which links to us to get a lot of hits. So yeah, it's it's great networking and marketing. Thank, thanks so much. Well, it looks like we're at the end of our hour here, so we'll wrap it up. All the um, contact information is, is listed here. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. I can provide any information that you might need. And uh, if you have a business or, or tribal enterprise that you'd like listed on nativeamerica.travel or lewisandclark.travel, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to, to talk to you and, and help, uh, help you get that listing up on these websites. So thanks again to all our speakers and we appreciate it. It was a, a great webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.